the doctor is in. Hi guys, it's your pal, Dr. Sal, and today we're gonna take a look at tonsil stones, AKA tonsillates. So this video was uh, basically prompted to my mind because in the last week I saw a young guy um, with one of these tonsil stones. And in this episode, we're gonna take a look at what causes tonsil stones, what are tonsil stones, and how can you get rid of them, both professionally and from home. So first off, let's take a look at what a tonsil stone even looks like. What is a tonsil stone? So if we look down here at my anatomy board, I'm just gonna show you using a screenshot. This is a screenshot taken off the internet from uh, Wikimedia. Now what you'll see here is this little dingly thing here is uh, the individual's uvula, the little dingly thing there. This is the tonsil here, tonsil here. Now this is a normal healthy tonsil on this side. And whoa, you can see there's definitely something not right here with this dude. See right there that big white cauliflower appearing um, uh, structure? That is the tonsilith, AKA tonsil stone. Now you might find it a little odd or bizarre that you would have or be able to form a stone in your throat. Well, it actually turns out your body is actually exceptionally good at producing stones. In fact, I can tell you right now, you've got 206 stones in your body as you sit or stand watching this presentation. That's called your skeleton. Every bone in your body is basically a biological stone. You also form stones in your kidneys. You can also form them in your inner ear. You can form them in your brain. You can form them in tendons. So forming stones, your body is no stranger to forming um, stones in other words. However, in most people, um, I would say 90% of people uh, never are aware or have never had one of these tonsil stones. So why is it that some people seem to be afflicted once, sometimes multiple um, serial type uh, stone formers? Well, the answer to that is not totally clear, but I'll show you what we know to this point. So we're gonna call this um, patient here, Tasha. And um, actually, before I tell you about Tasha, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about this story about the guy I saw in the past week. So he gave a story of, um, he was just sitting there, minding his own business, eating some ravioli. It was nice, soft, it was slurping back, it was delicious. He was having a good time with his meal when suddenly, out of the blue, he felt like somebody had taken a knife and stabbed it into his tonsil. So this, uh, so when I looked in, basically I saw what you, what I showed you on the phone there, uh, much smaller uh, tonsillate than that. And it might shock you, but some of these tonsillates can actually get pretty large. So um, I got a little, a little uh, scale here to give you an example. Some of the biggest ones recorded have been up to 42 grams. So if you consider that this battery here is 45 grams, that gives you some idea of the kind of monster that can happen. Of course, that would be rare. Most cases are uh, fractions of a gram, usually very, very tiny little things, which would be uh, more like the norm. So um, getting back to this case here of uh, Tasha, she discovers she has a tonsil stone. So first up, what are the most common symptoms of having a tonsil stone? Well, believe it or not, the most common thing is absolutely nothing. You don't even notice that it's there. And for that reason, just like my buddy uh, last week that I saw there with the stone, most people, when they first look in their throat and see one of these stones, they immediately misconstrue that that stone must have just formed in the last day or two because they can't believe it was there probably for months to years. But the stones don't radiate over 24 hours. It's just that most of the time, because they cause no symptoms, they just percolate there quietly like cavities forming until you finally notice something going wrong. Just like when you get a toothache from a cavity. And that being said, uh, a lot of the formation also um, is kind of similar to forming a tooth plaque. So if you imagine this is the, um, this is not her tonsil, this is a stone here, grossly exaggerated. So if I were to take her tonsil out, I'm um, just gonna draw a little tonsil here. One of the things you'll notice about tonsils is they're a lot like a miniature brain. There's lots of grooves in them and folds. They're not, they're not perfectly smooth. There's lots of crevices, which we call crypts. So that's the first thing that um, 
it, the, the first enemy that allows um, stone formation is these little crypts. If the tonsil was perfectly smooth, uh, it'd be hard for any any um, plot to form on it. <clears throat> so the first step is you'd have to have crypts. So these little folds here, these are called crypts. So that's step number one. The next thing to make this, um, to perpetrate this uh, crime is you need to have food or debris, which is really easy because obviously the tonsils right on the path after you eat and swallow is gonna get stuff sticking into these crypts. So you have a, a milieu there of a bunch of different fibers and food particles and all kind of nasty crap there sitting around. Some of it lodges and sticks its way into these uh, crevices. Then you have our old friend, which is also used in forming cavities, bacteria. So I'll draw the bacteria. It's this little uh, rectangle guy here. He's got a little smirk on him. He's up to no mischief. Sorry, up to lots of mischief. So this is our bacteria here. So you have a, a family of um, bacteria starting to live on this nice little um, uh, moon surface with this crevice here in your throat. Uh, fed by all this food debris passing by, wishing to pass here, some of it getting caught. So just like um, with formation of a cavity, initially what you get is a, a film. So say it, starting here, so you get this nasty film first, which causes some inflammation. And then gradually over time, the film actually starts to protect itself by depositing um, calcium and other salts into the region which then forms a little stone. So just bring you back again to the appearance here. Let me see if I can get this a little brighter for you. So again, looking here, um, this isn't the result of 24 hours of action. This is probably months or years of bacterial um, activity to get a stone that large. It's, uh, Benjamin Franklin used to say, constant dropping wears away stones. Well, this is the opposite thing. Uh, constant dropping of a little bit of deposition over time. You come back um, months or years later and you have a monster like that. Okay, so that's how they're formed. And um, by the way, the tonsil, why do we even need tonsils? Well, the tonsils are basically a sentry system. It's like having a police station in your throat. So inside the tonsil, there's lots of um, lymphocytes and other defense um, uh, what do you call it? cells. So I'm just gonna draw this here as a tonsil. So here's our tonsil. So it's a defense method, uh, a defense point. So that's uh, one of the reasons why you get things like strep throat and other kind of sore throats is because that was the first line of defense when some invader came in. It gets stopped at this uh, security checkpoint and then the tonsils get swollen. So that's why we have tonsils. Now, um, so I was mentioning what are the most common um, side effects for having um, a tonsillith or a tonsil stone. Well, the two most common things, like I said, first and by far the most common is absolutely nothing. So you don't notice a thing wrong until something does go wrong. And the second is uh, bad breath or halitosis. Many cases of halitosis, if um, carefully looked at, there's an element of um, one of these uh, stones. Another curious thing is that um, I've never seen one of these stones in anybody over 50. Very often it's young adults, like the gentleman I saw last week, um, he was probably maybe 22 or some, somewhere in that area. And I remember also personally having um, one of these uh, tonsil stones once probably when I was about um, maybe around 13 or 14. Uh, ironically enough, I was in chemistry class and suddenly I, for whatever reason, I suddenly felt this uh, this little hard bit in my rolling around in my mouth, on my tongue. So I couldn't figure out what that was all about because I was just in there paying attention to benzene rings and whatever else we were talking about then. I extracted the, um, extracted the little rock out, the little flick, and it was the most putrid thing I have ever smelled in my life. And trust me, working as a medical doctor for over a decade, I've smelled some real horrors. But this little tiny thing, 
man, it packed quite a punch. I was like, WTF, what the fibula? It was so, such a stink pong. So I was glad to be rid of that. And I remember it was a little, a little bit more, um, a little darker than the one I showed you in, in the photograph there of someone else's tonsillith. But um, since that time, I've never had one since. It was just a one-off, I've never seen one again. So one of the other um, risk factors besides uh, having Crips, food, bacteria, and things like um, chronic sinusitis where you're constantly having mucus bathing over here is also age, so youth usually young adults and why that is don't know now the million dollar question uh, that everybody's gonna want to know is yes that's great to know what uh, tonsil stone is but uh, dot how do you get rid of that I looked in my throat and I've got one oh I forgot there's a, a third a third uh, symptom too which is actually why my guy had come in last week the third thing is um, pain when you swallow so Basically, most of the time you feel nothing, and then occasionally when you start swallowing, you might notice that it causes pain. In his case, what had happened is the the tonsillith, uh, it looked as though it had gotten sheared, maybe by something that he ate. So instead of being a smooth stone, when I looked in his throat, it was almost jagging and pointing out. So obviously, as his tongue rolled past it, it would scrape. So that's what was causing pain. And some people, even though it's doing nothing, will just notice them by, by accident because they look in the mirror. Or, like what happened to me, they expectorate one of these little stones and wonder, where the heck did that come from? And then they look at their throat and say, gee, oh, that was just the tip of an iceberg. So, um, uh, getting back to how do we get rid of them? Well, there's, uh, there's two different broad ways. So I'm just going to draw a little line here. Can you see that? Yeah. So I'm going to call this one the professional way, which is to see one of my homeboys at ear, nose and throat. Or the other way is just um, dealing with it from home. So I'm going to deal with the professional way first, which is to see uh, ear, nose and throat, ENT. Uh, there's more than one method that, um, that they can use to remove it. I'm a family doc myself, so I don't do this. What I would do is uh, refer you on to one of my colleagues that specialize in ENT. So one method is um, you take a freezing agent, spray it inside the throat, psh, 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 then uh, that reduces the ability to feel any any pain. And then you use a, a tool that we call a curette. A curette is almost, uh, I don't have one with me right now, but it's, it's almost like a, a long metal, um, consider it like a fork if you want to, but it's, it's more cylindrical. And then on the end, it has a tiny microscopic, I don't call it microscopic, but like a very small spoon on the end. Much smaller than you know, obviously you would eat as well, unless you were feeding like I don't know, a budgie or something like that. So anyway, that's what a curette is. So the curette, you would just go in after the throat is numb and then you gradually, you just pick away at the stone and pop it out. Uh, so that's uh, called a curette. Curettage, if you want to say it in a nice French lingo. Uh, another uh, more modern method is using laser therapy. So basically you scald it off the area, blast it off. Um, and then one of my um, colleagues downtown, they they have some new fancy ultrasound thing, which, which I believe what it does is just like for kidney stones, it, it shakes the stone um, by resonance and causes it to shatter. So these are the pro methods for getting rid of the stone. Now from home, now from home, it, just because you're doing something from home doesn't mean it can't work. It can be effective. It just depends on your patient's level. Um, if you're a patient, then you can do it from home too by doing a um, chemical gargle. So what you're doing is a chemical attrition warfare on the stone. So morning and night, you can either gargle with uh, peroxide, H2O2, and another method is gargling morning and night with um, uh, vinegar, apple cider vinegar. Now, I don't really have a preference of one over the other. Obviously, if you have a huge stone or is causing pain, then you probably want the faster method, which would be the professional method. If it's not too bad and you can wait, you got time to burn, then you probably could just do these uh, gargles. And just to give you an example of how the chemical method works, I set up a little experiment here for you to see. This is a bit of an exaggeration, but um, 
we're gonna imagine this here is my stone here made uh, predominantly of calcium so I'm just gonna break it in half so we've got my calcium there on either side then in this little bottle here we've got some apple cider vinegar so vinegar and calcium creates a uh, chemical reaction so I did remember some of that chemistry um, when I pulled out my tonsil stone so you see when I add it it's causing a fizzy chemical reaction there breaking down the stone well you can't smell this over YouTube but it actually smells quite nice Ooh, it's kind of refreshing clean smelling no um, so that's using um, apple cider vinegar this one here is using hydrogen peroxide which I picked up here at Walmart and um, you'll notice it always comes in a brown bottle that's because it's uh, photo degradative if you leave it in Sun it destroys the uh, properties of it basically turns it back into water so you always want a fresh bottle and you should notice that when you swish it in your mouth it starts forming a bubbling and you know it's active so we're gonna try a little bit of this on this side too and this one's a little more indolent it's not as fast as the acid base reaction with the um, with the vinegar but again you can see it's coming to life you can see that sweet bubbling hmm this one mm. This one isn't as uh, as aggressive. It smells, it's almost smell less. Whereas this one had a kind of clean smell. So anyway, this is uh, showing you um, basically an exaggerated version of what you're doing by gargling twice a day using those, um, causing these acid base reactions. Now, in real life, the, the process is gonna be much slower because each time the stone, uh, you can't get at the interior of the stone when you're uh, gargling. All you're doing is getting rid of the surface at a time. So each time you gargle, you destroy a little bit more of the surface and a little bit more of the surface bit by bit like erosion until finally either the stone crumbles under its own uh, weight or fragments into pieces and falls out or you just keep um, destroying the, the chemically degrading it until there's nothing left. So there you go. That's Again, this is an exaggeration. It won't be this fast when you're actually doing it with your gargles. Um, so that, ladies and gentlemen, is tonsil stones and tonsilliths in a nutshell, pun intended, and um, how to how you can get rid of them from home or professionally by seeing one of my uh, colleagues. So thank you so much for watching. This is again Dr. Sal, and I'll have more Dr. Secrets coming for you in the next week or two. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Get notified of new videos. Subscribe now.